This is the Married to Doctors podcast, episode number 56. Well, it's it's like anything else. It, it seems you, you work it out in your head and your heart and you go, this is what we need to do. And then you realize what you got yourself into. Mm-hmm. And you go, oh God, now what do I do with this? So I have great stories to tell, but it was really rather challenging to go through. Welcome to the Married to Doctors podcast. Because we know that being married to a doctor isn't always as glamorous as it sounds. Our podcast helps successful homes be happier. We're here to build community, hear your stories, and explore solutions with the experts. Here's your host, Laura McKeldry. Hey, I just wanted to wish all of my listeners a very happy, happy Thanksgiving. If you're getting this podcast on the day it's released, it's Thanksgiving Day 2018. So... A very happy Thanksgiving. And if you are alone while your physician spouse is working and you're far from friends and family, just know that uh, virtual hugs here. I I see you. I hear you. I know you're there and I'm cheering for you. So keep up the good work. I know the holidays can be difficult. Speaking of the holidays, I do have an ultimate gift guide I've put together on my website. I hope you'll check it out. It's got some Q&A is about what's appropriate as far as gift giving, as well as some gift suggestions. So you can run over there to the website and check that out as you get ready to jump into a holiday buying mode. I've tried to make it a little bit easier for you. Super excited about our guest today. I have Julie Yamamoto. She is going to talk to us about a variety of topics. She has a lot of expertise and some really interesting stories to share with us. I know you'll find this delightful, as did I, so enjoy the episode. Today's sponsored minute is with Lawrence Keller of Physician Financial Services. Lawrence, I wanted to ask you, what are recurrent disabilities and are they typically covered? Well, essentially, if after the end of a period of disability, uninsured, so that's the person that's insured under the policy, becomes disabled again, the latter period of disability will be deemed the continuation of the previous disability if it occurs within a specified period of time, typically 12 months. If the disability results entirely or in part of the same or related cause as the previous disability and benefits were paid under the policy for that previous disability, they don't need to satisfy a new elimination period. And a recurrent disability provision is a clause that's a standard provision in a policy and not something that actually needs to be purchased. Excellent. And if you guys are interested in educating yourself more on disability insurance, you can visit physicianfinancialservices.com. Julie Yamamoto, thank you so much for joining me on the Married to Doctors podcast. I am glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. This is going to be such a fun conversation. Before we started recording, I was telling you that I believe you're the first person I've interviewed whose spouse trained outside of the United States with the exception of, there's a few people I've talked to that were American citizens that trained at Ross University in Dominica, but I haven't really talked to someone who's married to a foreigner, trained in a foreign country, and then came here to the United States to work. So this is going to be a new perspective and I'm really excited about it. Yeah. I am a strange bird in a lot of ways. I think there are more people out there like me, but we're, we're not the majority by any sense. Yeah, well, go ahead and just introduce yourself a little bit to my audience. My name is Julie Yamamoto, and I'm a native of Ohio. I'm currently located in Olympia, Washington. And my husband is a neurosurgeon in practice out here. He was born and raised in Japan. And we have two children. The second one just started college. So we are trying to find our way in the empty nest. It's not all that comfortable right now, but we're still new to it. I have a full-time job as a college instructor at St. Martin's University here in Lacey. And I teach composition, English, business communications. I advise the student newspaper and do some academic advising. So I wear a lot of different hats and I find that parenting was really good training for that. You get to do all kinds of tasks. And I also have a freelance medical and scholarly editing business that I call The Right Place. And I kind of fell into that by total accident that I'll explain that later. My husband and I have been married 25 years 
And I guess that makes me sort of a veteran, but I still feel like I'm pretty new at this whole marriage game. Um, we married kind of late. We were in our early 30s. So we both had pretty independent and well-formed personalities by that point. And I think that's been really helpful in finding our way through a challenging profession, marriage, facing some cross-cultural challenges and other things as well. Sure. So tell us a little bit more about your love story. When did you guys meet? We met in 1989 in Jackson, Mississippi at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Um, I had ended up down there after grad school, you know, peripatetic lifestyle here, and uh, stumbled across a neurosurgeon at the university who was trying to climb the academic ladder, was doing a lot of publishing, and he came across my resume, saw the master's in English degree, and hired me by phone on the spot because he had been looking for an editor for a long time. I didn't know anything about medical editing. I didn't know that there was such a career, but I credit him with helping me broaden my career perspective and get some really good experience. In the meantime, my husband had come from Japan as one of the chain of Japanese doctors who were working in that department with the head of neurosurgery in Mississippi. And so we actually were sharing an office at one point, and he was doing research and needed some editing help as well. So we were colleagues. And, you know, one thing leads to another, and you never know where that's going to go. <laughs> well, that's, that's great. I'm glad you two found each other. Yeah. 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 So when you met him, he was a physician already in Japan. Is that correct? Yes. He had completed his MD. It's a little different in Japan. Instead of doing an undergraduate degree and then med medical school, you go straight into medical school from high school, and it's a six-year program. So he had finished that, and he had done his five or six years of neurosurgical residency as well. So when he came here, it was on a fellowship with the University of Mississippi Medical Center to do stroke research. And so all of his medical training and residency had already been completed. Okay. And was his intention to train to do the fellowship in strokes and then to return to Japan and work? Or was he hopeful no. to stay? <laughs> no, he had figured out, I think, before he even got here that he wanted to stay permanently in the United States. And he was on what's known as a J-1 visa. It's a cultural exchange visa through the State Department or whatever they called that department at that time. So the idea was that you would come here, do research, and as long as you were on the research version of the J-1 visa, you could stay as long as they continue to renew the visa. There were no restrictions. So that was the first step, was getting over here. And then the next step was trying to find a way to stay. And that is not easy for a foreigner. At the end of his research time in Mississippi, we were looking at ways that he could get into a residency program in the United States because, and I, I think this is still true, the United States does not recognize medical training done elsewhere, except for, I think, some of the schools in the Caribbean and Canada. So even though he had done his full residency in Japan, it counted for nothing here, and he knew that he would have to repeat his residency. So yeah, we... This, I'm going to pause you just for a second and just sure. say... This totally blows my mind that someone would do a neurosurgery residency, <laughs> not once, but twice. twice. Yeah. And that's, and that's amazing to me. I know for neurosurgeons here in the States, that's a seven-year commitment. Is it the same length of time in Japan? Pretty much. I think it was five or six years there. And uh, at the time he was doing it here, it was six years, plus he had a half-year fellowship that kind of launched him into the residency at Mayo. So it, it, was, it was a really long, arduous trek for him to be able to stay here in the United States to practice medicine. Sure. Uh, and by the time he's attending here in the States, he has 14 years of experience in neurosurgery. Yes. yes. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So when he was doing the residency here, I mean, he, he was probably better trained than maybe some of the people that had on staff there. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but he had quite a bit of experience behind him already. And you can imagine going through it the second time, it's a lot less fun. 
Well, yeah. And it's hard because, you know, the pay is so vastly different, you know, it's like one tenth of the pay or something. So right. it, that's, that's just crazy. I know um, when my husband was in surgery residency, we had foreign medical grads as well, and they were repeating surgery residencies. Mm. And it, it was amazing to see them, you know, willing to come here and do that Yes. Um, in hopes to, to, to stay and to get a job here and to go through that training again. Some of them had been through training, worked for a couple of years, and then came to the United States. Yes. And so it was always amazing to see them with such, you know, with so much experience, you know, and they almost became mentors. Yes. Um, regardless of what year they were in. Right. And it takes an incredible amount of stamina. We had sent letters before he, well, backing up a little bit here, there was a point where he needed to, re from Mississippi, he needed to return to Japan to finish because he finished his Japanese version of his PhD as well, based on the research he was doing in Jackson. So he had to go back to Japan for a year to finish that. But before he left, we canvassed all neurosurgical programs in the country trying to find this opportunity for him to return so he could redo the residency and stay in the United States. And of course, this all involves, oh, the FMLA exams, the ECFMG exams, licensing. I mean, he had to do all of that, as do others in the field, but the foreigners are up against an extra set of tests, too. Mm -hmm. So before he left to finish his work in Japan, we sent letters to every neurosurgical program in the country trying to find that opportunity for him to come back. And we got a few responses, a whole lot who didn't respond at all. And in one case that I still recall, we got the letter that we sent returned to us with a note scrawled across the bottom, we do not accept foreigners in our programs. And I went, wow. Uh, that seemed really harsh. Now, this was about 1990, so it's been a while ago. Okay. And I have to pause you too for a second and just ask if this isn't too personal, you know, why did he not want to go back to Japan and practice? Yeah. Um, you know, Japan is a very well developed country, but they have vastly more neurosurgeons than they need. And he was looking for a place here that would give him the opportunity to use his talent and his skill. And it's, it's pretty much the traditional immigrant story. He could have a better professional life here, and he could have a, a more freedom on a personal level as well. Yeah, so, and where was your relationship at this point? Were you guys pretty serious? Were you already married? No, we were dating, and I knew he had to go back to Japan and that he was trying to come back. So I, I was helping him through that, not even knowing where this was going to go. So he went back to Japan for a year, and the man who had originally hired me, Dr. Al Mefti, had gotten hired up at Loyola in Chicago and arranged to take me with him as his editor to that university. So Yoshi went back to Japan. I went up to Chicago. And then when he was finished with his obligations in Japan, he came back to the States. I helped him move up to Minnesota because he had been accepted as a fellow at the Mayo Clinic. And they then, after six months, accepted him outside the match into the residency program. So I knew that he was co going to come back, that he would be in Minnesota. I helped him get settled. And I was actually going to walk away from the relationship at that point because I didn't have a sense that it was going anywhere. Mm. And so we moved him up to Minnesota. And he asked me if I was going to come back and visit. And I said, well, uh, no, I, I, I don't think so, because it doesn't seem like this is going anywhere. And that's when he spilled the beans that he had been planning, if he could get anchored back in the United States, that he wanted to get married. And I went, oh, well, good to know. Um, <laughs> thanks for letting me in on that plan. And yeah, sure, let's do that. So oh, wow. OK. Yeah, so I actually, by total accident again, found a job in Rochester, Minnesota, and moved up there, and then we were married in the fall of that year, and we've been moving around and making adjustments ever since. And after he finished his residency, did he have any troubles at that point with, with getting a job with his foreign status, or did your marriage help that situation? Oh, no, 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 no. And this is a sliver of immigration law that I was not aware of, and it taught me that 
most of us really have no clue how our immigration laws work. We think we do and we think we know, but there are all kinds of exceptions. When Yoshi came back from Japan, he was on a J-1 visa again, but this time it was a clinical visa. And that visa came with, and I think it's still true, what's called the two-year home rule. And that means after you are done with your training program, you are obligated to return to your home country for at least two years before you are eligible in any way to come back to the United States. And being married to an American does not help in that okay. situation. So I tried my best to get a waiver for that rule because as I said, Japan was overstocked with neurosurgeons. Um, there were wonderful opportunities in the United States. We had one child at that point. My daughter was two years old. We were trying to have more children. It didn't make sense to have to sit out two years back home. Mm -hmm. And um, the waiver was denied. I learned a lot about how the immigration system does or does not work when it reviews these cases. Right. And so we ended up in Japan for two years. Okay. Mark Do you think that was good for you to go and, and spend time there where he was from? You know, he proposed that he go back by himself and that I stay here. And that is something that the United States thinks is perfectly acceptable to split up a family. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I'm kind of traditional. It's like, no, we're a family. We stay together. And so he arranged to go back to his home university. They arranged for a position for him there. And um, I got hooked up with an American who has an editing service over in Kyoto. So I was doing some editing and I was also teaching culture and language classes to some of Yoshi's colleagues who planned to come and study in the West for a while. So I did have professional work and I had told him before we left, I would need something like that to focus on and to feel productive. Mm -hmm. It was a hard, grueling two years. I was marking days off on the calendar <laughs> to oh, motivate wow. myself, but we were trying to live very frugally because we didn't know where we would end up after those two years. So we were in a three-room apartment, sleeping on futons, on the tatami mats, on the floor. He was working back in the department he trained in, and I was tending to my daughter, and we had our son when we were over there. So I went through the pregnancy and labor and delivery situation. And I was working part-time editing and teaching language and culture as well. Japan is a beautiful, beautiful country and is very, very hospitable, especially to Westerners. But the day-to-day -day life there is just much harder than it is in the United States. And we were trying to be especially frugal because we didn't know what the future held for us. So it was fantastic education for me to see the environment he grew up in and to live in the culture day to day. I learned a lot. It is valuable knowledge that I still draw from. Would I want to repeat it? Not in that circumstance. We've been back to visit Japan many times. It is a beautiful country, uh, very gracious and hospitable people, but that was a particularly difficult situation, in part because he was so frustrated at not being able to start his career yet. Oh my gosh, are you kidding? After, <laughs> yes. that's only human, right? Like he, at this yes. point, he has done two residencies, fellowships. Oh wait, we need neurosurgeons in the United States, but hold up, why don't you yep. go home for a couple years, even right. though you're you know, married and you have a child here and you've been here, what, by then he'd spent seven, eight, nine years here? Yes. Yeah. It's like, yeah. why don't you go home for a couple years and then maybe, you know, come back and... <laughs> right. And part of it is, I understand the premise of the cultural exchange that you take your knowledge back to your home country, but there's also a political motivation there is that we're happy to train foreign doctors, but we want to send them home and have them stay there and not be a competition perhaps for physicians here. Mm -hmm. um, the other peculiarity, and it's because we have this uh, international marriage, is that back in Japan, he's expected to behave as a traditional Japanese would. And he had been out of the country for yeah, close to 10 years at that point. That was hard for him because the Japanese culture is, is much more restrictive than the American culture and much more rule bound. And he had been out for a long time. And there's a certain point where it's good to be out and training in the West, but 
there's this sense when you come back that you are somehow not quite Japanese. There's a sort of fear of contamination. So he was struggling with having to behave as a traditional Japanese would. And then he had this American wife. And that's an unusual scenario, especially the part of the country we were in. And I was struggling with just the day-to-day -day work, and I'm not proficient in the language. So that basically rendered me illiterate over there. And that was an enlightening experience to be a, a, a minority and illiterate in a culture. It's taught me a lot. Yeah, especially considering your education. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, it's in English, right? You know, um, I knew a, a basic amount of Japanese to have minimal conversations, but not enough to carry out the day-to-day -day activities. So I became much more dependent on him. And at that point, he was earning more than I was. So there was the money issue where when he was doing his residency at Mayo, I was working full-time at an editing company and at IBM and was making a larger salary than he was. So there was that shift as well. But we learned to kind of work the system. In Japan, when you went to work, it was eight in the morning and you stayed till midnight doing research or doing whatever was required of you. And this would be five, six, seven days a week sometimes. And then in his case, he was also moonlighting at a private hospital to bring in some extra money. So we kind of learned to work that you can have an advantage as a foreign wife anyway, because you come in with different expectations. So if he wanted to be home for dinner, which he tried to do almost every day, he would say, well, you know, I've got this foreign wife at home, this American, she expects me to be home for dinner, so I'll see you later. And he would come home. And oh, nice. <laughs> you wouldn't get away with that if you were married to another Japanese. And when my son was born in the hospital there, at that time, this would have been 2000, they still kept women in the hospital for a week after the birth of a baby. And the Americans by that time were shoving women out the door within a day or two, right? Right. So I was getting a little antsy in the hospital ward there. And being illiterate, I made kind of an amusing mistake. I went to the shower room down the hall because I was ready for a shower and noticed a sign on the door, but couldn't read it. So I just went in and took my shower. And that was actually a problem because that sign on the door specified the hours that people were allowed to use the shower room. And I was outside that schedule. So the nurses talked to Yoshi and said, you know, she can't do that. That's our rule says you can only take a shower during these certain hours. And I looked at Yoshi and I said, can you get me out of here? I, I just need to go home. So again, we pulled out the excuse, well, you know, she's an American. In America, they do it differently. She wants to be released. And he sprung me from the hospital so I could go home. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, man. That, but that must have been, been an interesting stay. I, I just, uh, I admire your courage for going over there and trying all these new things on your own. Well, it's, it's like anything else. It, it seems you, you work it out in your head and your heart and you go, this is what we need to do. And then you realize what you got yourself into. Mm -hmm. and you go, oh God, now what do I do with this? So I have great stories to tell, but it was really rather challenging to go through. Now, the advantage for him is that while he was there, he didn't really get to do much surgery because of the numbers of, of neurosurgeons in the country. And then there's a hierarchy so that the better cases would go to the more senior surgeons. And there's a pecking order, and you had to wait your turn. So he was only getting to do surgery maybe once a month versus, you know, six, seven times a week here, right? But it gave him time to do board certification. So he's actually certified in Japan, and he's board certified in the United States as well. So it wasn't a loss. We both learned a lot. It challenged our marriage in a lot of ways. I'm glad I did it, but I really would not want to repeat that particular scenario again. Yeah, definitely sounds like a, a challenge. Do you have any other times when the cultural differences were, I don't know, maybe just funny or maybe just something annoying <laughs> that you want to share just because of the two different backgrounds that you come from? Yeah, you know, I um, even though I come from the Midwest, which is a pretty traditional culture, and I, I think in many ways it bears similarities to the Japanese culture, which might be why some of this works, I 
I'm more on the liberal side of things, and I, I have always struggled with following rules that don't make sense to me. So you put me in a culture that's very rule-bound, and, and I'm going to have a hard time. So I learned to you know, bite my tongue and sit on my hands and just observe and, and try not to judge. And Yoshi's had to learn the same thing here. Americans do things differently, and it didn't always make sense to him. But the one scenario that sticks in my head is a discussion about a carrot one night as we were preparing dinner. I was peeling the carrot, and he looked at me and said, that's not how you do it. That's not how you peel a carrot. And I looked at him, and I went, it's a carrot. I have the peeler. I'm taking the peel off. What's the problem? And <laughs> it's like, it's a carrot. What, what, how can you peel a carrot wrong? And for him, the issue was I had not washed the carrot before I started to peel it. And when he said, you need to wash it first, I stopped for a minute and I looked at him and I said, well, from my pragmatic Midwestern culture, it's like, why would you wash something you're going to throw away? And he stopped and he looked at me and, and then he just kind of walked out of the kitchen and I went, wow, a carrot, who knew that this could be a, a cultural um, point of contention. Oh, that's funny. Well, if it makes you feel any better, Josh and I are always arguing over like what knives to use and we're both very American. So, but he usually wins. He's like, I'm a surgeon. I know knives. Oh, yes. Wrong knife to cut that. I'm like, okay, <laughs> sir. Get Whatever out the lasers. Can. Where are the lasers? <laughs> Yeah, cooking with Josh is, um, yeah, we've gotten in a couple of fights sometimes because he's such a methodical right. surgeon type. I mean, he makes excellent meals when he does choose to make mm -hmm. something, but right. he's very, you know, recipe bound. And I'm like, you know, just sub this or sub this, or I'll, I'll do things to taste. A lot of times he just can't stand it. He <laughs> likes my food, but he can't stand to watch the process of uh, yes. it on the table. You can... I've, I've learned to work this in my favor here. I mean, we're, we're talking about a surgeon's personality and there's a certain perfectionism and, and need to control, yeah? Um, and the Japanese are even more concerned about perfectionism and fear of right. contamination. They're doing it with chopsticks. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah, and I, I did learn the chopstick technique and I'm, I'm pretty good. I can do spaghetti with chopsticks, so I'm proud of that. Nice, nice. Um, but I've learned, and this took probably 10, 15 years of marriage to figure out, right, is that I'm in the kitchen cooking, and he's kind of hovering around the edges, and soon enough, he's stepping in and telling me how it should be done, or what I'm, I'm not doing, right? And I've learned that's the moment to hand it off to him and get him in the kitchen doing it because he needs to control the process. Mm -hmm. And instead of resenting that now, I go, oh... This is my moment to get out of the kitchen and you know go do something else. Oh, he's because, available. Here you go. You can there start you go, and chopping or whatever needs done, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I mean, like like any marriage, you work out these these friction points on a day-to-day -day basis. So in some respects, this marriage is the same as any other marriage is. The culture has actually presented fewer problems for us than you might expect. Uh, the Japanese are fastidious, meticulous people, um, responsible, educated, and, and I'm fascinated by other cultures, so I've done what I can to educate myself and come to recognize the beauty of that particular culture. So the points of friction for us have been more the male-female stuff, mm -hmm. you know, those, those differences in, in how a man thinks versus how a, a woman thinks. And um, probably the profession, the demands on him because of the profession have created more troubles than the cross-cultural Japanese-American combination. Do you have any like specific communication or good ways to start those conversations when they're challenging? Well, I've learned that in Japan, you rarely say what you mean and you rarely say it directly. You learn to speak obliquely and there is a very deep subtext in a Japanese conversation. So what is presented on the surface in words is only a sliver of the meaning that the speaker intends. And the assumption is that the listener will understand that subtext. And so I've missed the boat on many occasions when my husband will say something and I'm just reading the surface. 
and I miss the subtext and he gets flustered or upset or something. Like when he asks if you're going to come visit and he was really basically proposing in the same conversation. Uh, maybe that was it. <laughs> I, I just go with the words. I'm a word person. Right, right. Right, right. And what I, what I think he has learned and it, I realized is that he reads sometimes greater subtext into what I say and will make a decision or take an action based on what he thought I meant when all I really meant was what I said. Because where I come from, we say what we mean, we mean what we say, there is no subtext. There's no hidden agenda. There's no passive aggressive communication. And so that's tripped us up a few times. But as far as starting conversations um, with him about difficult subjects, I learned don't do it over dinner because he was always very good about getting home for dinner whenever possible. And you know what those surgical schedules are like and what it's like to be on call. Dinner is to be a pleasant experience. And so if you're bringing up something contentious or difficult, that's not the time to do it. And given that you don't speak directly about confrontational things in Japan, I've learned I have to kind of come in the side door or come in the back door. And I learned rather than make statements about the particular situation or topic, if I start with a question, it's, it's a softer introduction of something that's uncomfortable. It's that sort of oblique approach. And it's putting it out there for his input before I come back and say, well, this is what I think. Mm -hmm. So those are a couple of the techniques that I've learned. And then I've done a lot of reading on child development and marital dynamics and the differences between men and women in terms of brain structure and how that influences behavior. And so some of the recommendations there work. It's like when, and this works with my son too, if you have something serious to talk about, get in the car and drive somewhere and have the conversation while you're driving because then you're both focused out the front window. It doesn't feel like confrontation and there's some distractions along the way to kind of soften the conversation. And that's a technique that I think has been recommended in general conversations between men and women. Mm -hmm. Or talk to him when he's engrossed in something that takes his attention slightly off the topic so that it doesn't feel like a confrontation. Yeah, that's good. I have this app on my phone that's kind of like a crossword app. And sometimes I'll sit with one of my boys and we're kind of working on that together but then I can ask them about their day or something. Yes. And then they'll actually kind of talk to me, you yes. know, and sometimes they'll even say, hey, mom, can we, you know, play this app? And I'm like, sure. Because right. like, when do I talk to my kids? You know, there I have five boys and I find it hard to get <laughs> information out of them. You know, I'm like, give yeah, me more, give me more, give me more, you know. Right, right. How was school? Fine. You know, yep. <laughs> they don't. Yep. They What'd, don't you do in, What'd you do in school? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, unless it's a last minute, you know, costume that they need or something oh. like that. And then they tell me, you know, it's always last minute. <laughs> or it's something, something that's really close to their heart. I can get my, my son seems to be interested in computer science and video games. I mean, he'll, he'll talk a blue streak there, but oh, ask yeah. him how his day went or what he did at school. You get one word answers. Yeah. And I used to be offended by that until I realized, no, that's, that's just a method of communication. Yeah, so, that's, that's one way of doing it. Yeah. So how has it been with your, your kiddos? So one was born here in the States, the other in Japan. Do they both have dual citizenship or either? Yes, or? they do. Okay. For, Fortunately, Japan at one time only allowed, until about 1985, Japan only passed citizenship down through the male side. And in 1985, they changed it. So it comes down through the male and female side in Japan, same way as it does in the United States. So when both kids were born, I registered them, you know, as birth certificates as American citizens, and Yoshi still takes care of keeping their Japanese passports up to date, filling out the, oh, I forget the name for it, the family register and checking in with the consulate and getting passports renewed. Now, we've hit an interesting point with the kids because in Japan... At the age of 21 or 22, if you have dual citizenship, you're supposed to declare which one you are giving up. Mm. And we're experimenting with how strict this rule is because my daughter turned 21 almost a year ago. 
and she needed to renew her passport. And so we didn't know when my husband took her to the consulate in Seattle, we didn't know if they were going to give her a passport again because the passports are good for five years. And there seemed to be no issue. So she is a dual citizen, at least for another four years, even though it's past that point where technically she's supposed to choose mm -hmm. which citizenship she wants. And we'll hit that same point with my son too. And I'm hoping that Japan realizes that it's just better to have, have people keep the dual citizenship, even though it might feel impure or like some sort of contamination to Japan. Um, their population is shrinking. They need citizens. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense to me to force people to give it up. The Americans used to force people to choose when they had dual citizenship, but they got rid of that rule a long time ago. So it's not a problem from the American side at all. As for the empty nest, it's not comfortable. You realize how many years have gone into raising your children. For us, it's been close to 23 years. And suddenly your day doesn't revolve around their schedules. It's a shift in it's, it's actually a shift more mentally for me than it is in terms of time because I'm working. My schedule hasn't changed that much. And by the time you send your children off, they're pretty self-sufficient. So they haven't really been needing a lot of moment-to-moment -moment care, but your, your mind knows that they're there and they're there at the dinner table. And so if I've gained any time by them being gone, it's, it's a minimal amount, and it's been taken up by reabsorbing the tasks that the kids used to do. So guess who gets to take the trash up the hill now on trash right. night? <laughs> and guess who gets to empty the dishwasher? It's like, wait a minute, I thought I was going to have all this time, and nothing has changed as far as my schedule goes. Right, and I know that this can be a tricky time for marriages. A lot of marriages kind of evolve at this point and some some go through some rocky times you know around the empty nest time it also coincides a lot of times near retirement yeah, yeah. how are you guys doing at this well point? we're still kind of new at this because um, my son just left in august and i was dreading it and it, if i have a moment where nothing's distracting me i still feel very sad but i remind myself they're out doing good things they're out starting to find their lives and that's what we send our children out in the world to do so it's a good thing even though i feel very sad about it it's kind of laid the marriage bare you're you're picking up where you left off before you had kids and you don't really realize how much of your energy has been sidetracked into raising the kids until they're not there anymore so I have this sense of, oh, uh, it's, it's you again. <laughs> and what do we do? Do we just pick up where we left off before you know, the kids were born 20 some years ago? You can't really do that because you're not the same people anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm kind of stepping back to see where the energy goes and how this is evolving. Because my husband feels the loss of his children very significantly as well. My son's only two hours down the road, so we've, we've been down there a few times in the last few months, finding excuses, right? Because it's to check up on him, but it's, it's also for us. We're going through this period of separation, and with him, we can, we can ease it because he's only two hours away. My daughter is over in Chicago, so it's not so easy to, to get access to her. I'm finding that it's, it's sort of new again. We're feeling each other out again. We're communicating about more issues that just involve the two of us. And it's feeling kind of nice so far. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a long kind of painful process of letting go of this previous role and trying to find your way in a new role. Yeah, I can imagine. Do you guys have anything that you're really looking forward to? Did you guys have one day when all the kids leave, we're going to do, I don't know, something. Do you have any well, awesome goals or dreams? I have a ton of great ideas. All these things I put on the back burner, places I'd like to go, projects I'd like to take on, and he's still working. 
nothing's changed in his work world. Oh, right. You're married to a doctor. That's what this show's all about. <laughs> it is. And until he retires, I don't think he's going to make that mental shift. We've been, we've been going to more concerts and doing maybe some more social contacts with some people, but you don't have vast stretches of time to travel until he's actually retired. And that's well, maybe 10 years down the road here. Right. And with as much time as he, he took and as really as all physicians take to, to get to do what they do, do you think it's harder maybe for physicians to retire? Um, I'm trying to think the ones that I've known. When we came back from Japan, he was hired in a private practice in Kentucky, supposedly to take the place of a senior physician who was going to retire. We were there almost five years, and the man did not retire. And we moved out here, and I think he finally is out of practice, but <laughs> he, he could not retire. And, you know, my dad went through the same thing. He retired from his accounting business when he was 85. And surgery in particular, because of the demands, does not allow a lot of time to build hobbies. It's hard to keep a balanced life. And, and so much of their identity is about the work, taking care of the patients, you know, getting the cases done, following up, taking call, whatever that is. And it's so consuming that it leaves a huge void in other parts of their lives. And I'm already recognizing he's going to have to find things to transition into before he retires, or it will be very, very hard. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he goes in at 536 in the morning, does rounds, does the cases, does the clinic. He is coming home for dinner. And thankfully, his call schedule isn't too bad. But it's still all about the work. And it's been, whew, how many years? 30 years where your whole identity is work. So it's going to be a very difficult shift for him. Um, so I expect that we'll have a, a point of friction at that point. But I'm hoping it's eight, 10 years down the road here, because I'm still trying to adjust to where we are now. Yeah, I do find this this very fascinating because there's the what's it called the fire movement, which is the financial independent. Yes, retire early. You know that seems to be very trendy right now, and a lot of right. physicians are like, you know, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to retire by age forty, and and all this right. stuff. And even if you can do it mathematically, it's not necessarily what all physicians want to do you know no. sure, some people want to do that and that's fine you know I'm not saying it's right or wrong it's just different for each person I know there's a joke probably a lot of my listeners have heard this but it's something to the effect of do you like surgery well enough to do it in your free time <laughs> the answer is yes then go into surgery because that's what you're going to do in your free time you know right Saying, not that like, you not don't that you have can... a lot of free time, you know, that is yeah. your free time. It's all your time. Yeah, it's not like you can do surgery as a hobby. You really do have to be in it day, day in and day out, right? right. And I, I think about these people retiring early and I'm like, so you're spending, you know, so much time getting trained and then only working X number of years. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, again, no judgment, you know, do your life your way, but it's it's interesting to me. And I can see how for some people, they're like, no, 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 this this is me. This is who yeah. I want to be. You I know, think and I want to do this work. I think about it in terms of teaching because I, I am a teacher at heart. It follows me everywhere I go. Even when I'm not in the classroom or not doing lesson plans, I'll, see, I'll hear something on the radio and go, oh, I can use that in class. Cool. Let me write that down. So I think if it's really integral to your identity. You, you can't do it as a hobby. You can't do it part-time. If it happens to be a skill that you really enjoy and you're good at, but it's not all-consuming for you, yeah, you can maybe look for other avenues. But I think what's driving a lot of younger physicians to look at the alternatives, especially financial alternatives, sideline businesses, is the changes that are taking place in the medical profession as a whole where a lot of the physicians are now employed by hospitals, that it's almost impossible to make it as an independent physician anymore. The government restrictions, the insurance restrictions, so that doctors are becoming more and more like civil servants rather than this you know, prized profession. Not that there's anything wrong with being a civil servant, but the identity of the physician has changed from the perspective of patients as well. I'm seeing far more attacks on physicians as a profession than I ever used to see. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of it may be justified. There, there are rogues in every profession, 
and you hear horror stories, but it seems like doc, people are looking to blame doctors for things that doctors aren't even responsible for, for insurance, for insurance coverage, for example, or the restrictions on the appointment times, for example. Those aren't driven by the doctors. Those are driven by the medical industry. Mm -hmm. And I think it's those changes in the medical industry that are driving younger physicians to look at a wider perspective in terms of professional activity and financial activity. Because right. who knows and where that's this what is a going. lot of them will say, you know, if you have your financial independence, you have more options. Yes. So that is a big part of it, you know. Yes, um, absolutely. Not all of them necessarily want to retire early, but it's nice to have that as an option. Right. Want. And who knows what the stock market's going to do to our retirement programs or investments. I think it's wise just for anybody in professions that are undergoing such dramatic change to make sure you know what your options are and keep them as broad as possible because you never know when you're going to have to make a shift. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, in our conversations prior to this interview, I noticed, you know, obviously you're a professor of English. You're very well read. And uh, I just wanted to ask you for some book recommendations that you might think would be helpful to any of us listening that are, you know, married to medicine. Yeah. I, I read extensively. And when I find myself in a new situation, I, I do a lot of my homework not for any scholarly reason, but just so I can get a handle on where I am. So before we went to Japan, I did a lot of reading about Japanese culture, food, you know, customs, that sort of thing. So at least I wasn't totally ignorant about what was going on. So I did the same thing when I got married, because we know marriage is one thing before you get into it, and then afterward, it's something else. And so I looked around for sources that would help me ground in marriage and when the children came would help me figure out what I was doing as a parent. And so there were, there's tons of material out there on child development and marriage and self-help. And I think 95% of it is crap designed to sell books because we all think we should somehow be doing things better than we are. It preys on our insecurities. And so I've done a lot of reading, but it's only been a minimal amount that was actually helpful to me. Some of that was the first um, Mars and Venus book, John Gray, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. The first book I found very helpful because it started to distinguish differences between men and women. And so you could start to see how it plays out in your own relationship. I think all the books after that were just built to capitalize on a money-making venture there. John Gottman has done a lot of marriage research. He's got a marriage research institute based at the University of Washington. And I read his first book and I found that very helpful. I think again, he's now spinning a lot out of his research and the later books are just kind of rehashing what he already said in the first book. There's a researcher here at the Evergreen State College by the name of Stephanie Kuntz. And she has done a lot of research on families and marriages historically and from an anthropological view. And I found her work refreshing because it reflected some of the truths that I was experiencing that the mainstream books and media don't go near, kind of the ugly underside or the historical patterns and traditions of marriages. Because what we've got now is this romantic ideal of it all being about love and you're finding your soulmate and you're in perfect sync. And if you're not happy, you should get out of it. And I, I just don't think that that mindset is realistic if you really want to make a marriage work. And so Stephanie Kuntz gets into that. Elizabeth Gilbert, the woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, I hated that book, but she has a book on marriage too that I found very useful, and she gets into some of the historical perspective too. The American Medical Association has a book called The Medical Marriage. It's by Wayne and Mary Sotil. It's maybe in a newer edition than I have, but it addresses perfectly the problems that a medical marriage faces that other marriages do not. And so I found that one very helpful. For anyone in a cross-cultural marriage, there were a couple of books. One is called Mixed Matches. It's by Joel Crone. And then there's another one called Intercultural Marriage by Dugan Romano. And I think those books are still in print. So those were the ones that I found really helpful. There's another researcher who I think does excellent work, both in relationships and child development. His name is Michael Gurion. He's based in Spokane, Washington. The best book of his is one called 
what could he be thinking? And it gets into the nitty gritty of communication between men and women and how the differences in brain structure feed behavior and how that plays out in a marriage. It was eye-opening and life-saving for me. So I highly recommend that one as well. Yeah, I love that title. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I have to have this book and I've annotated it because I, I always do that. I got all kinds of notes written in the book as I read. And then a general one, and the last one I'll mention is, it's a pretty popular one, Scott Peck, The Road Less Traveled. I think everyone could benefit from that. It's not strictly about marriage or medicine or child development. It's, it's a more philosophical approach to facing the difficulties in your life and embracing them rather than running away from them. So I pull that one out periodically and reread it as well. So there's my recommendations. It's probably more you than you were looking for, but no, I love it. I'll include them in the show notes and uh, let people help people to find them. So that's awesome. Yeah, I love that. Okay. Any other questions you want me to answer? I don't think so, unless you just have any um, last minute advice or wisdom to give any of us or someone that's still in medical school or on the younger end of things. What would you say? I think, unfortunately, we're still up against that stereotype of the doctor's wife sitting at home having tea and, you know, gossiping with her girlfriends. And maybe there are some wives out there doing that, but I don't know of any. I think younger generations are against some bigger challenges because of the changes in the medical profession as a whole. And I, I tend to be a realist with a, a, a foot in the world of optimism, Marriage is hard, even in the best of circumstances, and we're facing some particular challenges that make it more difficult sometimes. Take the long view. Um, when you're, you're up against times of trouble or you're doubting your choice, think about why you made the choice you made and think about how seriously you want to take your commitment to the marriage. Um, you're going to be up against some really difficult things. I think the spouse of any physician is kind of forced into becoming very independent. And I, I was very independent just by nature and also by living alone for a while before I got married. And I think that's been my salvation um, to have the ability to make decisions at the time they need to be made on my own because he's not always going to be there. You have to carve out your own identity and you have to find supports for when things get rough and your spouse may not be there to help you out with those things. So it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the marriage. Find the support that you need. Don't compare yourself to other marriages, especially, you know, the sweethearts from high school who, who have 40 hour work weeks and live two miles from their family we have a significant number of challenges because you're finding them hard. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong and you will go through periods where things are difficult, but you also on many occasions step back and be very, very proud of what you've committed to and what you've accomplished. That's beautiful advice. Thank you so much, Julie. I appreciate you coming on the show and sharing all this information with us. This has been a really fascinating interview. Well, thanks for the opportunity and keep doing what you're doing because I think it's really important and I'm, I'm seeing that other people are finding it important as well. Excellent. Thanks, Julie. Okay. Take care. So that's the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't yet, go to my website and check out the Ultimate Physician Gift Guide and see what you need to know about Christmas. If you missed last week's episode, it's all about etiquette and I've summarized it there in that article and also give a lot of good gift ideas. So go check it out. It's at marriedtodoctors.com. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Married to Doctors podcast. Our mission is to make successful homes happier. To learn more or to share your story, visit our website at marriedtodoctors.com.